Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome you all and thank you for joining us for another edition of the GW Biomedical Cross Disciplinary Seminar Series, the goal of which is to promote networking and collaboration from different disciplines to shift the paradigm from seeking a cure to developing a strategy of prevention. The topic of this inaugural year is inflammation and chronic disease. Today, we're highlighting the role of bioinformatics with a presentation on machine learning and intestinal inflammation from Sana Syed, MD, MS, from the University of Virginia and the UVA Child Health Research Center. Dr. Syed is a pediatric gastroenterologist and hepatologist who cares for children with a variety of conditions, including celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, poor weight gain, and various liver conditions. She's also a clinical scientist actively involved in research focused on using data science and computational methods such as artificial intelligence to study gut structure and function. We are thrilled to welcome Dr. Syed. Thank you for joining us. Hi everyone, thank you Leah. I really appreciate that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, let's see. Bear with me, there we go. And I'm gonna go into presentation mode. Please let me know if you guys see it, yeah? Looks good. Okay, so um, thank you again for giving me and us the opportunity to present our lab's work. The title of my talk, as Leah said, is Using Machine Learning to Investigate Intestinal Inflammation. So this is the outline of my talk. I'll be talking about GW and UVA in data science, why machine learning as a tool for inflammatory enteropathies. Uh, we'll talk about a couple of different domains in which we've been applying this, so global health, um, eosinophilic esophagitis and Crohn's, so global health diseases and ones here in the US, and then conclusions and future directions. So I always try to uh, look a little bit up about the institutions that I'm presenting at and my Five and a half year old is currently obsessed with Hamilton, so I wanted to put these pictures up. So that's Washington on the left and Jefferson on the right, the first and third president of the US respectively. And so what I found really interesting was that uh, both these presidents actively advocated for the, for the uh, universities that are um, in their name or um, UVA in uh, Jefferson's academic village's name. And what I found really pertinent to this talk was the fact that both institutions have really advocated um, for data science. So they both have strong data science masters, including a, a really good focus on the capstone projects. And I actually pursued a master's of data science as part of my career development uh, last year. And um, this project four years ago actually began as a data science master's capstone. So to give you that piece of information. So moving on, um, how did um, we get started on this? And um, a little bit about global health. So this is a picture from um, sites in Pakistan, and uh, which is a low and middle income country. These are uh, pictures from a rural village called Matiari. And you can see that the, the condition of sanitation um, is poor and which has led to this disease called environmental entropathy. And that happy looking child on the right is me. I grew up in Pakistan and um, was part of a large family of doctors. And since the age, I would say about seven or eight, was actively involved in visiting villages like this and um, doing community good work. So my reason for pursuing gastroenterology is actually global health. So these are slides talking about why environmental entropathy matters. The clinical outcome that we look at is something called stunting, which is a height for a z-score less than minus two. And really what we, the reason why we care about it, going back one, is that stunting is a, is a measurable way in which eventually children, so children with stunting can end up developing cognitive impairment, which is a huge thing, poor vaccine responses, um, are susceptible to recurrent infections and have mortality. So this is a slide from the Gates Foundation highlighting why this is one of their uh, strategic goals. And so moving on from that, um, they really have this lovely picture showing that the epithelium in the gut in children growing up in developing countries is altered, leading to this enteropathy or enteric dysfunction. And this red box on the right uh, bottom side is um, really highlighting the projects that I've been a, a privileged to be a part of that led to this AI project. 
So data from this project was sourced um, from uh, several sites. The data I'm presenting is from UVA, Pakistan, and um, Zambia. So in summary, what is environmental entropathy? I've sort of given a very brief primer, but the gist of it is, is it's a condition from in, in, in primarily in developing countries in which you have this blunting of the, um, the absorptive surface inside your bowel, which leads to um, or is the underlying reason for high rates of stunting and oral vaccine failure. So there's this really urgent need to figure out, for example, if you're doing a rotavirus immunization campaign or now a COVID immunization campaign, which children will likely not respond to those vaccines, will need additional boosters, and is there a blood, stool, or urine marker? Now, the problem is the disease exists inside the gut. So gold standard is tissue diagnosis. And as a, by the way, that's true for all GI diseases. This is just to give a primer as to the direction our lab's gone. So EE specifically is understudied. So there's actually no histopathologic gold standard for diagnosis. So the picture here is of um, um, the endoscopy that we do. So you look inside the gut, you take these tiny biopsies that are two to three millimeters big. The problem then is it's small tissue, which stains, um, which features do you stain for? There's subjectivity in how we section the tissue and what you look at. And then there's overlap between enteropathies such as celiac in the US and environmental enteropathy. So again, as a primer, these particular challenges also exist across other GI diseases with tissue-based diagnosis. And this really speaks to why we can use these computational methods that do pattern recognition across images in multiple diseases, even though the work started in environmental entropathy. So this Gates Foundation meeting now several years ago, the question was, while we're using all these different approaches to study the tissue, to come up with a gold standard diagnosis for EE, can data science and machine learning help point in the right direction? And so use what we've developed and learned um, from diseases in um, high income countries and apply to a neglected disease of poverty. So specifically, and I'll go over the aims again, we wanted to know, can you teach a computer to distinguish between tissue from children who we think have environmental entropathy versus normal and a US controlled celiac? Can we make sense of this decision-making and what's a reasonable sample size to aim for? So before I talk about all of that, I want to give context about data science and machine learning in today's world. So. I think the best example of how we're surrounded by this is industry giants, so Facebook, Google, et cetera. In Facebook specifically and Instagram now, for any images that you upload onto the internet, Facebook creates a digital fingerprint and it tags your name. So that's a training set. It, it tags your name to the image that you have so, and learns to recognize patterns within your image. So this is a, a video that shows essentially what Facebook is doing in the background using algorithms that we have also now used. So it's taking your image, it's coming up with a pattern that's unique to you, that's a training set. And then say you or someone else uploads a picture that looks a lot like you, but it's unlabeled. It's used all that training data, that, that um, distinct digital fingerprint to then say, is this Brenna? Is this Sana? Is this Lee, right? Um, and so what we hope to do is say, can you look at a digital fingerprint of disease or infla inflammation in inflammatory enteropathies, and then use that to pinpoint specific um, um, issues with the um, tissue. So then what is machine learning? There's a lot of interchangeable words we use. Um, this uh, subset Venn diagram is a great way of saying it. So artificial intelligence, so I put a picture of Ada Lovelace just to say sort of women empowerment and say, um, she's actually probably one of the world's first computer programmers. She was British. <laughs> Thank you, Leah. I, I, I agree. You need to highlight women who've done science. And um, so uh, the birth of AI really came about in the 1950s. So the definition was the effort to automate intellectual tasks normally performed by humans. And there's subsets. So deep learning is what we're talking about is the application of machine learning to images. And here's sort of, a, a, again, a, a rough outline. So typically you have rules, you have data, you do classical programming, you get the answers. The revolution in image analysis came about when, when folks realized that if you take a bunch of image data and you have the labels, so the answers, so whether it's disease or pictures of people's faces, these, they are the, we have computational methods now 
that pick up the underlying function or the underlying patterns and distribution that then give you the rules. So an example here is, um, so here's a raw data of X, Y, you know, white and black dots. And so typically you might have to figure out and decide the coordinate change, but in ML, um, it comes up with it by itself. So to come up with a better representation. So then when you have unlabeled black or um, white balls, the computer then uses that as a prediction algorithm versus you actually having to code that up. So then what are, um, what is deep learning or convolution neural nets or CNNs, which is what I'll refer to going forward. So here's a picture of a bird and a dog and what the, the computer sees is just a row of numbers that represent um, RGB, red, green, blue, and pixels. So then the machine uses filters that scan input images looking for distinctive features. So what does that mean? So we see the three puppies the machine sees a matrix of numbers, colors at every pixel. And then the filter is starting from random everything. So horizontal vertical lines to shapes, um, all the way to complex patterns. So then if the filter is looking for a specific curve, like edge, for example, for the mouse, when it applies on an, an image that is trying to learn off, it'll generate high values called activations. And sorry, and that's the gist of what's happening in the background to give you some intuition, it's, it's not magic. So then, okay, if that's one of the tools that we're using, how does that apply to environmental entropathy? And so this is just to recognize that any work exists in the context of multiple people. We've been fortunate to have um, funding from several um, groups. So this work, like I said, involved data from two sites um, in terms of disease. So the Aga Khan University in Pakistan. So we have 10 environmental entropathy patients biopsies um, from there. So 10 patients, but more biopsies. And then Zambia, so 16 um, from there. And then UVA controls for celiac and histologically normal duodenal tissue. So this is a little complex when you look at it, but you'll see anytime you type deep learning or CNN on the internet, you'll see this image. All it is, is you're saying, Here's a biopsy. So if this is an example of a, 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 just a frozen section. You patch it up into tiles because it's too big to feed into the, the algorithm as a whole. And then you put it into this um, convolutional net. So a CNN, there are multiple different types. So ResNet 50, ResNet 101, AlexNet. And what we did is we paired it with the probability of celiac, EE, and normal. So our initial model, which we published in an engineering IEEE um, as, um, SIEDS 2019, showed an overall accuracy of 92%, which was great. So it meant even though humans were saying there's overlapping features, there's clearly things that distinguish EE from celiac and normal. So then how do you know that the, the models are learning off the right features? So what makes a dog a dog? So this is really a seminal paper that came out of 2017 out of, um, a group in Georgia Tech, um, Rod Sevlaraju is a, uh, or was a PhD student at that time, and the labs run by um, Devi Parik and Dropatra. And what they came up was a way to put these heat maps on. So for an algorithm that's classifying um, a cat versus a dog, you can see with the um, red colors being the most uh, relevant features, that it's looking at the right point. So it's not like, deciding a cat or a dog based off the, uh, for example, the picture of the, the part of the window. So then we applied these graph cams. So again, with the highest activation, so the most relevant features being the yellow feature, yellow color, you can see that the algorithm is specifically looking at structures within the tissue. So um, things like goblet cells, banded cells, and it's not looking at the white background, which is really good. So our objectives were to use machine learning image analysis to predict between environmental entropathy versus controls, and then look at distinguishing features to peak within this black box. So this is our pipeline in general. We take um, biopsies, we digitize them, we patch them, then we put them in different uh, models and then visualize uh, the model decision-making using heat maps. And um, the first challenge, you know, so as, as to share is anytime you have inter-site data was just color. You didn't want the algorithm to predict off color. And you can see from the three different sites, so the U.S., Zambia, and Pakistan, there was striking color differences. So first we came up with um, or applied approaches that are published for stain normalization using structure preserving methods. And then we put these into algorithms to help um, classify between the three. And we um, initially used a ResNet 50 and then 
compare that with a multi-zoom architecture and a shallow CNN, which are all fancy ways of saying that while these um, algorithms exist and these are industry benchmarks, we really have to tweak them and um, customize them for or biopsy-based inflammatory ML work. And what was interesting is, so what ML does it, is it doesn't tell you this feature is it. It gives you these, um, these patterns. So um, what we found was epithelial and lamina propria lymphocytes. So, so parts of the cells here, tissue here. And then it looked at um, goblet cells and secretory cells. So we're now validating these results in larger data sets along with um, immunohistochemistry. And we've also been fortunate, we just received notification of publication earlier this week, along with um, a paper that was published last year in JAMA Open. And so I, I can now say uh, very proudly that we successfully developed a machine learning image analysis platform that we're now validating, uh, but really for small bowel disease for environmental entropathy, celiac, and histologically normal duodenal tissue. So then the next steps for this work. So what is the intuition behind tissue grad cam? So when, you, when you're when you visualizing grad cams for a cat or a dog, you know what a cat looks like. You know what a dog looked like. Um, when you're doing that for tissue, you need to have some intuition because there is a chance that the, the heat maps can be just bias or, or artifact. So we've now started using um, uh, molecular data, so RNA-seq, so, so using key gene signatures and aligning them with the grad cams to see if they are complementary. Because essentially from work across different domains in medicine, we know your DNA makes RNA, RNA makes protein, and protein is what we're standing and looking in those um, pink and purple h and &E biopsies. So then where else can this lead us to? So eosinophilic esophagitis is the next disease I want to talk to you about. And again, this is a lot of work by a lot of people to just give credit where credit's due. So EOE may very well be the asthma of the esophagus. So this, this is a disease that was started initially being recognized in the late 1980s. Um, it's thought to be a cause for difficulty swallowing, which is what dysphagia is, food impactions, atypical chest and heart pain, heartburn, which doesn't typically respond to acid blockers. And we think there's underlying um, allergic and immune mediated mechanisms. So from, again, immune mediated, we know it's an inflammatory disease of the gut. So you can see uh, from this contrast x-ray, you know, you have narrowing of the esophagus. When we do a scope, so we put a video camera like this black tube down, you see these sort of... Um, um, longitudinal first, so this is normal in the progression to disease. And the tissue really becomes very abnormal with these uh, yellow, uh, with these uh, little circles denoting inflammatory eosinophil cells. So again, the power of um, AI is truly applicable when you apply it to large databases. We have an eosinophilic esophagitis database clinical cohort led by Emily McGowan and Baird Barnes. And so our question was, can we predict EOE clinical phenotypes using quantification of inflammatory cells? Now that's a lot of words. So I'm gonna talk about where's Waldo as an example. This is also my break slide. Um, so you can uh, take a little step back and, and breathe from all that I've been telling you. So where's Waldo? You have to hunt in, in a sea of images, right? So what, what do we do in GI diagnosis? It's literally exactly this. So in EOE, the disease is in the esophagus. So then um, a gastroenterologist like myself, we put a video camera down, you're feeding tube. We take tiny pieces of tissue. Again, these are tiny. These are two to three millimeters um, uh, big. And then another kind of physician called a pathologist looks at these in high magnification. So this is an example of normal esophageal tissue, so no inflammatory cells, zero. And eosinophilic esophagitis, you really see all these little, uh, I mean, even visually, you can say there's a proliferation of little dots or inflammatory cells. So current EO tissue diagnosis is based off really looking at rare Waldo-like events in a sea of tissue. Now, that said, there's plenty of severe disease in which you have 100 or 200 eosinophils per high power field of your microscope, um, but there are all these edge cases in which um, um, an AI algorithm would be valuable. So in our cohort of um, less than 18-year-old um, children, we took 37 patients with EOE, 59 who had histologically normal um, esophageal tissue, and we followed a six to 12-month clinical outcome to say, 
based on diagnostic biopsies at that were treatment naive at the time of diagnosis based off the tissue, could you predict which patient would go on to develop a stricturing versus non-stricturing phenotype? So first step was to automate EO quantification. This is laborious work. This takes hours and hours. So Alexis Carlado, who is now a dental student at Cornell, um, sorry, Columbia in New York, she spent pretty much, I think, over a year and a half doing this. And Will Adorno is a PhD student in our lab who then developed this architecture. So you can see the prediction, the, you know, the yellow circles match up really well with the annotations. So then we said, let's look at just EOs and say, um, how are we doing in terms of EOs, EO, EOE classification based on a human derived criteria, so eosinophil quantification. And we had about 97% accuracy. This is um, a poster that was uh, accepted to DDW um, earlier this year um, that um, um, Alexis presented. So our eosinophil count error also to tell you was approximately plus minus two. So this would be really valuable in two ways. One, in edge cases, so you know, instead of a human having to zoom in, zoom out and count every single eosinophil laboriously, um, the algorithm could help screen, but it would also help us give intuition as to what, so precision medicine type intuitions as to what can happen to a patient six to 12 months um, from now at the time of diagnosis. So then we um, did correlations to look at esophageal locations and then um, by stricturing phenotype. So you can see that the distal, so the most farthest away part of the esophagus and the mid esophagus typically have more EO counts. And there really wasn't a huge difference. Again, this is a very limited data set um, based off just EO counts for stricturing and non-stricturing phenotypes. So, um, so then we said, all right, let's see if the uh, model can give us additional insights. Now, there's been work, and I'll show you those references by pathologists, clinical gastroenterologists who are perplexed by this disease in which patients go on to have histologically remission. So your EO counts go to less than 15, but they continue to have symptoms. So are there other features in the biopsies that we need to be looking at? So we said, great, what's our best algorithm to pick patterns in um, across uh, multiple images? So we made a model for EOE versus histologically normal tissue. And we got great classification accuracies. Again, this is based off our limited numbers. So 94 for EOE and 99 for normal. So then we then overlaid these heat maps and the EO prediction models along with the EO counts. So here, this shows you those, all those little tiny um, yellow dots are the predicted eosinophils. But to go back, you can see um, these high activation areas, so all the red dots are covering. So it is covering areas which have eos, but it seemed to also be looking at biopsy that had less eosinophils. So to show you another slide, um, we initially then went back to the literature and said, if grad cams are focusing on features other than just eosinophils, where's the intuition for that? And we found all sorts of literature saying, well, the basal layer of the epithelium can be a predictor, it can be a feature seen in EOE that's currently not part of its diagnosis, dilated uh, intracellular spaces, persistent basal cell hyperplasia. And so this is an example of a biopsy that has less eosinophils, and you can clearly say it's picking up um, this basal cell hyperplasia in, um, in dilated um, intracellular spaces. So that has been just exciting, fun work. And, and so you can see how thinking in a data science way, so instead of having a specific disease focus, sort of stepping back and say, how can these different approaches inform us to make um, discoveries across diseases has really served our group well. And so the, la the last disease I'm going to talk about is Crohn's disease, which is an inflammatory enteropathy. Um, just in the interest of time, I've not gone into details of what Crohn's disease is, but this is also an um, inflammatory disease of the gut. It's an autoimmune disease. And like EOE, one of the progression and cl complications that you can have are um, stricturing versus penetrating disease. So we said, we collaborated with Ted Denson. He's one of the international leaders in pediatric IBD. And we said, again, based on otherwise indistinguishable ileal biopsies at the time of diagnosis, can we predict Crohn's disease progression complications? This was actually a very well 
phenotyped a cohort in which the complications follow for up to five years. So the initial study for the risk cohort were from 28 sites and our data was just actually 10 patients in each category it's from a subset that is now being validated. And the initial study, just to tell you from the 28 sites, I mean, they have had insights that have been published in Nature, Cell, Science, um, Lancet, you name it. Um, so we have uh, validation data from a subset of the initial study. And our goals was to look at Crohn's septides based off a classification system called the Montreal system to look at B1, B2, B3. So we said, similar to the prior work, can we use machine learning to study first healthy and diseased and then to look uh, within the subsets and then see the, the idea of the, in, um, the complementary molecular and structural um, um, uh, uh, framework, which I'd shown you a little bit earlier. So again, same approach, same sort of figures. You, you feed in HD biopsies for um, a training data set. You train off a normal B1, B2, and B3, and then predict off unlabeled biopsy. So we found in our initial models that we were really good at predicting um, um, stricturing disease, so B2. Just to tell you and give you context, Currently, at the time of diagnosis, when you get biopsies in patients with this really high morbidity disease, which is Crohn's disease, all we can say at the time of diagnosis right now using these H&E biopsies is that you have Crohn's versus not. So everybody gets the same treatment, the same sort of algorithmic treatment pathway versus a precision medicine um, route, which is really what data science aims for and what we've already achieved in diseases like cancer. So then we said, great, let's apply heat maps, make sure we're looking at things um, that can actually make meaning. Now, the little panel on the right, so because this is a very well-defined cohort, there's actually lots of omics data. There was B2 RNA-seq expression data, which had been emphasizing using functional um, annotations, macrophage and fibroblast activations pathways associated with extracellular matrix. A lot of verbiage to say, what you're seeing in this middle panel of B2 in the high activation areas and the yellow areas, it's picking up these pink sort of extracellular matrix areas. So there really is um, human intuition that's matching with what the algorithm's looking at. We then also used um, uh, more um, uh, exploratory methods. So this is a GMM based model that Rasul Salis worked on. I apologize, I don't have his picture here. But you can clearly see, I mean, this is so interesting. Typically, humans say that this, these blue circles versus all the other circles. So they can tell difference between blue versus purple, orange, green, and red. And what our algorithms are saying, you can, at the time of diagnosis, clearly separate between blue and um, green and red, so B2, B3, and then B1 also separates out and and, and then, you know, they are diseases that has overlap. And this is just on our prelim data. So there's validation efforts ongoing. So I've talked to you now about GW, why machine learning for inflammatory enteropathies, global health, um, data science in today's world. I talked to you about environmental enteropathy, um, our work in eosinophilic esophagitis, Crohn's disease. And now I'm going to talk about some conclusions and future directions. And I, I purposefully made sure this talk while was, or session is for an hour, we should be done in the next five, maybe 10 minutes. So I would encourage all of you guys to come up with questions because one of the most exciting parts about giving a talk at any forum is really the privilege of your time. So um, I have team members from my lab on this, um, on this call too, on this, this webinar. And we want to hear your input. We wanna hear your questions and hear um, insights that may be generated as you all are listening to these um, prelim data. So what do we conclude? Machine learning is a promising, powerful tool for pattern recognition in GI. GI depends, gastroenterology as a field depends on histopathological tissue-based diagnosis, a sea of information looking for that where's Waldo. And then we can match these histopathological tissue features and patterns of disease with clinical phenotypes of interest. So what's unique about this is, so I was, so in my capstone um, 
uh, last year we worked with um, image data from the match, so similar algorithms, but tailoring them to a different data set. And so we had the opportunity to present our work at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and we had, you know, leading researchers from Microsoft and Columbia, Cornell, et cetera. And so someone said to me, well, there's nothing unique about the work you all are doing other than your unique access to archival patient data. And I was sort of like, that's true. Uh, as physicians, we do have this unique access in um, really the privilege and um, a lot of responsibility to be good um, custodians of this private confidential data our patients are um, entrusting us with. I will also say that later on, you know, when you think about these conversations, you go back and kick yourself. And I went back and I said, really, no, we have an innovative group that's publishing and engineering journals because none of these algorithms you can just apply right away. There's a lot of thought, there's a lot of customization. So not just are we developing these um, unique tools and these platforms um, um, uniquely accessible, uh, uniquely applicable, applicable to GI diseases, um, but they are also then applicable to other biopsy-based diseases. It's actually one of the grants I'm working on right now in the NIH with that premise. Now, one of the issues that you can see, I talked about one, two, three years, uh, our students have been working on these projects. And a lot of it is related to the annotation which is a critical bottleneck. And I will say, unlike the field of cancer in which there was really a huge impetus to people sharing really, really large data sets really fast and openly and publicly, that's um, driven a lot of the innovations. To give you an example, there are breast cancer data sets from um, France, from Montreal, from Canada, from multiple hospitals in the US. And we're not quite there for, um, for gastroenterology. And then I do like to say garbage in, garbage out, right? So if you ever see um, deep learning models without peeking into the black box, so it's just garbage in, right? You have to be aware of the potential bias in your data set. That was actually the entire purpose of us doing the Metropolitan Museum of Art data, because in art, bias is something that's relatively easy to see. One of the things and one of our students presented last week at TomTom, a machine learning a sort of cultural conference. Uh, we were interested in seeing how art is biased for gender data. And we know this across the industry. Google actually has refused to um, now label men versus women. And there was a New York Times article that come out um, saying Google's algorithms are great for um, uh, uh, recognizing um, and tagging you uh, if you're a white man and then a white woman and then a male of color and then a woman of color because algorithms just um, internalize the bias that exists out there. So as far as the, the MAT data or art data, if there has been a historical um, bias in which cultures are represented or what a man should look like, so we had bias in that the, the MAT data trained on what was already labeled would confuse Native Americans with long hair as women versus men, or um, um, South Asian men wearing sort of longer togas, or um, Japanese men from historical art as women versus men. So the same thing, when if you, we are not thoughtful as to what is true normal in um, the esophagus, or um, if we don't have complementary omics data, then really we are not assessing bias, and to some extent the 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 adage of garbage in, garbage out would apply to our work too. So there is that element of rigor and re re reproducibility. So we're actively working on a digital GI pathology rep repository. Um, I would love um, folks here at GW, elsewhere, spread the word. We are looking for data that you're willing to share. Um, we are working towards feature visualization and then moving towards correlation with numerical metadata. So um, to give an example, for Crohn's disease, there are other signatures that predict stricturing, but nothing up to 90 or 100%. So if we can get a number or a um, vector representation of the features that you're looking at these biopsies, and then plug it into a regular regression model with gender, um, age, et cetera, can you optimize your prediction? Uh, we're working on models for other GI diseases, and we're starting some interesting work for text-to-image annotation models. This is our lab. So we have, um, we call ourselves the, the um, gastroenterology um, data science lab at UVA. We have undergraduates in biology. We have med students working with us. 
We have very, very smart and talented um, staff dental scientists and research assistants with biology and medical backgrounds. And we have engineering and CS PhD students. Don Browd is my compadre. He's the founding director of the Data Science Institute here at UVA. Um, and um, he's a, a mentor and a collaborator of mine. And we've been working together now for four years since I joined UVA. And so that is where I will end my talk and I will invite questions. I will leave these slides up um, so that they provoke um, questions from the audience related to what we talked about. And I do see some chat questions. So, um, oh, so yes. So Actually, that was just some instructions, but I just want to say thank you. That was wonderful while everyone is thinking of their questions. Um, and I particularly appreciate your comment about garbage in, garbage out, because I do think in this area, that's something that is often overlooked um, and the excitement to just get something going. Yes, I mean, AI is a magic, you know, <laughs> so that's the big thing to say. Um, when you're being you have to be really careful of the questions. So we can sometimes, you know, even we can get lost in these fun engineering questions or um, innovations that we're working on. But at the end of the day, the tool has to answer the question. So AI isn't magic. That's one of the take holes. Great, thank you. And if, if anyone has a question, comment, please just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask, or you can put it in the chat. So I guess maybe I can ask um, you, Leah, or anybody else here from um, uh, GW. So what are the kind of insights you all have gained from this really um, innovative um, cross um, interdisciplinary series you guys have started on inflammation? And um, what kind of work do you have ongoing at GW related to uh, machine learning or computational bioinformatics? I would love to hear from, um, the people on the webinar? That's a great question. Um, I think in general, what we can say is that inflammation seems to be at the root of all the chronic diseases that we're struggling with, um, and that it's very complex, like what you're talking about in your talk. It's not very straightforward. Um, in terms of what's going on, I see Tim McCaffrey's on this seminar. He actually already gave a talk in the seminar series. And I think he might be better able to answer um, what's going on at GW related to this. Tim, can I call on you? Uh, sure. Thank uh, you. I'm, I'm actually in the lab and we're doing transcriptome-based diagnostics of inflammation, uh, looking at neutrophil activation in, in various disorders. Uh, there, there are some uh, we have some large uh, computational groups here that I'd be happy to <clears throat> connect you with. Um, I guess my, my question is that sort of going forward, the, the trick here is we're trying to take this in, into the clinic. Now we're doing blood-based work, but let me tell you two painful things that we've learned. And first of all, when you develop a diagnostic, you've got to prove yeah. that you're better than, um, than a clinical diagnosis. Yeah. Words, that your method is better than throwing it under a, um, under a microscope. Yeah. That's, that's a surprisingly high Same. bar. To yeah. <laughs> um, and, I completely and, agree. And so my question to you also though, is I'm guessing that in your, in your confusion matrix, I can turn on my video. I guess in, in your confusion matrix, you're you're probably comparing your machine diagnosis to the to the clinical diagnosis by the pathologist. Yeah, it's a very good question. So so we've sort of had a few different approaches depending on our resources. As our fundings increase, we now have two pathologists as part of our group. I didn't actually show their pictures. I apologize. Um, so. So I'll go by the three diseases I showed. So for eosinophilic esophagitis, we are using the, the clinical diagnosis in the chart and then um, the histopathologic diagnosis. So what we're saying is how well can um, this replicate um, or AI algorithm replicate the clinical diagnosis? So that's one. But then there's a subset to the work. We're doing eo quantification. So what we're doing is um, 
we're we're doing manual reviews. So we we have pathology trained technicians who then go spend hours and hours annotating eosinophils. <laughs> We, and then, so the predicted EOs are then reviewed. And then the ones that are um, incorrect, or they, they go back and make the algorithm better. The second way of kind of coming up with the gold standard for making sure the models are doing what they should be doing is using IHC. So in a subset of the models that are training the EOE algorithm, we um, have taken the clinical biopsies that we had digitized. Um, we're working with our core to strip the h &E off and put an EO-specific immunohistochemical stain. So then we can then say, <laughs> just exactly, that's been the biggest critique in any medical paper, is uh, how do you know? <laughs> so um, the big papers in JAMA for, um, for, uh, for breast cancer, the chameleon data set, if you're familiar with that, those are data sets in which things, things have been benchmarked by, you know, tens of, you know, 10, 20, 30 pathologists, which we don't have resources now for do, doing, because some of it is, I mean, there really, there is no publication out there for AI and EOE. There are, I can count on my hand, the number of publications we have for celiac, and especially none in pediatrics. So to some extent, we're sort of saying we're starting this, we're adding to whatever's out there, and, and yes, <laughs> more funding we get, the more pathologists we add on. Um, no, 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 don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to your problem. No, no, I, no that's um, a very, very... The RNA-seq is a great way of... Um, so, you know, Ted Dent said he's, he's a leader. So when you email leaders, they typically are very skeptic of work unless you can show value. So what had actually happened was um, they uh, have a preprint out of a gastroenterology paper that sh that highlights these extracellular matrix uh, signals. And when we had, and we had this prelim data, so it was a really good match in which um, he, he, it was actually he who was interested because he said, this is aligning really well. So the basis for the Litwin grant, um, we've got this um, high risk, high innovation, um, IBD pioneers grant from the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America. So we're trying to be really creative, innovative to figure out what the ground truth is. Now, one of the limitations obviously for RNA-seq data is um, ideally you'd have methylomics data also. So we have that and all this is so expensive. And so uh, we're primarily working with partners who already have this data. So for, for environmental entropathy, for example, we actually have methylomics data. Well, that was the ASTMH initial work that, um, that abstract I showed that we're presenting next week. So, in the, the methylomics data from all the 13,000 genes we had expressed, so the 13,000 protein coding um, genes that we had expressed in ramal entropathy, 40% were methylated. Um, so they were turned off, right? So then really, and that's ideally what we should be doing with the IBD data also, but I, I, I'm just accessing data that exists. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so we're using sort of molecular ideas paired with um, depending on the question, gastro, uh, gastroenterologist, pathologist, and then really trying to use the clinical um, benchmark as much because that data exists. Um, and that's the text to image annotation work that we started to say, well, you know, if in all, in the biopsies that we're doing EO quantifications and we're getting these broad numbers, if the histopathological clinical report already says, EOE consistent with greater than 100 EOs for high power field, then you can use that as a benchmark versus having some poor undergrad count, <laughs> yeah. you know, seven or so. I'll give you, I'll give you a, a, a couple of suggestions and then hopefully some other people have thought of, of questions. The one of the, we've done as much RNA-seq probably as anybody. Yeah. And what I would encourage you to do is figure out the reproducibility of it in your system. So what they won't tell you is that the, the major platforms, things like Illumina, for instance, yeah. the, the, if you run the same sample twice, you don't get the same answer. So That's when you go, when you then go to try and validate your algorithm, right uh, it's going to yeah. be a train wreck. Yeah, no, I, and you know, the methylomics is also huge in that, right? So A, there's this element of reproducibility in what you're generating. And then, I mean, you know, if, if you look for correlations in millions and millions of data points, you will find something, right? right. 
Yeah, um, so, yeah, so all of those points are very well taken. I'm actually just typing that part about um, reproducibility. The other problem, um, Tim, as you know, is doing omics is very, very expensive. So even though it's become cheaper, it's still very, very expensive. And so um, one of the things we're also doing is there's there have been published papers now out of um, uh, MGH and Brigham and Cincinnati in which you... So one of the biggest cost limitations to doing omics is, at least for tissue, you have to take the fresh tissue and immediately put it in RNA later to preserve those um, tiny RNAs. Um, but what they've done is um, they've compared uh, fresh, so um, paraffin embedded tissue versus fresh uh, biopsy samples in RNA later to, um, to just assess sequencing depth and see sort of the top gene signatures. And um, again, so again, that's another layer of our reproducibility, but what it does give us is access to more data in the archival samples that we already have. So we've also gotten a, a, a very small seed grant from our um, UVA CTSA to answer that very question. So the problem is our tools aren't perfect and there are lots of clinical questions to be answered. I do think part of it will be to just try these different ways, acknowledge the limitations we have as technology becomes cheaper, uh, specifically, you know, the Lumina platforms, the inter-machine variability, et cetera. I'm just typing that out, so I have that point. Great, thank you. I, um, I think John Pan had a question. I saw him unmute before we went off on that one. Uh, speaking as a sort of dinosaur in clinical practice, because I graduated from medical school in 1970. <laughs> okay. So this is all foreign territory for me. But, but thinking way ahead is that, I mean, you're trying to attack a system that's so complex. I mean, from, from your oral cavity to your anal, you know, yeah. I mean, I, it's, it's just a, a very challenging system to to try to sort of systemize and in, in you know and and in, in terms and in terms of tissue sampling uh that's another sort of expensive uh aspect of of your diagnostic approach and, and in terms of bringing it to a global health aspect i mean technically you you can you you your wish is to bring it to to the world where where the you know the gastroenterologists are not there and not available yeah. Creating yeah. A, so robotics is something that you can swallow and sample along the way. You know, it's 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 very challenging and very exciting. You know, there's things that you can do. Yeah, I mean, your points are very well taken. I'll give you the analogy for the endoscopy work. Um, we're doing a, sort of a different version of endoscopy work, but there are other groups. So Ryan Stidham and his collaborators at Michigan, for example. So they have done AI on, um, um, on videos of colonoscopies. Now the same thing, there are multiple, of Im multiple images and you have one report. So what they have now developed are, or gotten our grants to look at exactly your point. So getting, so the biopsy equivalent would be well, you've got, come up with this algorithm for EOE. How do you make it um, rigorous and reproducible? So let's do studies in which we then go into patients and sequentially get biopsy at every level and then see if or um, algorithms um, stand up. So in, in the endoscopy work, what they're doing is they're, um, they are coming up with scores or sort of um, physician interpretations of segments of the of the video and then using that to match up and redu reduce the variability. In the biopsy work, you, you're exactly right. You know, as I, uh, so as a gastroenterologist, I deal with multiple diagnostic um, platforms, right? So radiology, endoscopy, biopsy, et cetera, bio, blood biomarkers. And so to some extent, as I delved into that, we have pathology training in our fellowship, but nothing like this. I actually, number one, was absolutely dumbfounded that we, act, we, we are even able to diagnose these disease given how tiny the biopsy samples are. And so the fact that we're even able to catch disease is a little bit ridiculous. And we see that bear out clinically. There are plenty of patients who have symptoms whose biopsy showed nothing. And so then we have to either 
rescope them, et cetera. The dream obviously is to pick up correlations from the tissue in the blood or stool. So then you're able to screen and pick up people uh, disease early. But you're exactly right. In, in a specialty that unlike cancer, you don't get the whole tumor out and you base your diagnosis on that and you have these nice clean um, tumor margins. And even in that, there's this concept of metastasis. In GI, you sort of visualizing, you know, when you do the scope, you're kind of seeing disease versus non-disease, what you think mucosally in the super high, um, low power view. And then you're getting these tiny pieces of biopsies in areas that are diseased um, or you think are diseased and you're trying to capture a spectrum of um, disease severity, um, all of which are very complex questions. We actually are putting together a, a proposal to NIBIB combining um, MRI, so MR endography uh, plus biopsy to sort of say, well, you're getting this patchy interpretation of tissue. And then you can also look externally using MR to again, to your point as how can you holistically put it together um, to limit the variability um, or sort of, and come up with a better idea of disease severity. Ideally, we, so everybody has biopsies, pretty much everyone has MRs um, in that particular project, but uh, most of the time you don't record your, your, cap, your endoscopies upper and lower. So that's just a data science opportunity lost. Um, so, but yes, it, you know, talks and seminars like these are so important because um, inflammation is truly cross-disciplinary. And it's when you hear of opportunities like this, or masses of data, but is it useful, right? And how do you make the data useful? And how do you prospectively then say with minimal um, financial resources, how can you collect the more relevant data? So for in GI disease, really one of the best things we could do is make videos off the scopes that we do. So you're getting human um, interpretation, but then we can also pair AI. We have MR already, all, all of that's digitized um, in its inherent nature, radiology, and then pathology, if we can digitize more, because that's physical, it's a physical piece of tissue. Um, but those opportunities have not, uh, have not gotten there yet. So it's exciting, there's a lot to do. There's a lot to get done. Yeah, that's great. So, so you're young, so you've got lots of uh, years left to uh, do the work. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Dr. Pat, I will say, you know, uh, your perspective as a dinosaur is very valuable. There's this um, institute called the Alan Alda Institute. Alan Alda, you may remember, is one of the MASH actors. And so he actually uh, uh, realized that when physicians or scientists speak about science, they, they don't get their point across. And so they, they now teach how to communicate science um, as uh, using comedy um, and all these different strategies. So strategies that they use in stand-up comedy. So one of their analogies was dinosaurs. I, I wanted to make sure I tell you that. So one of the points they make is, you know, when chickens talk to chickens, they speak the same language. But most of the time, when you're doing these scientific talks, you have a, a you know, you, you're either speaking to a dinosaur, you're speaking to an egg, and you've got to be able to speak to everyone. So uh, I, I hope uh, our story came across. And I really do appreciate your input as a dinosaur. Thank you very much. We really enjoy your talk. That's a really fantastic point. It's something I am also passionate about, science communication, because um, you know, it doesn't matter if you do fantastic work, if it just goes in a journal and dies, then yeah. we're not moving forward. Yep, that's huge. And you should look into this. It's called the Allen Alder Institute. We actually, so you can actually go get training and then become someone who can give workshops at your institution. So we had um, one PhD scientist and one MD um, clinical scientist get that training. And I actually got part of that training at UVA as part of our career, young scholar career development. And it's fun, like you, you really, you have to think creatively. So part of the where's Waldo idea came from there. You, ha you have to be able to give the, the big story while showing some of the weeds. Yeah, and I would, I would say that was very effective. It's something we can all, relate to. Everyone's seen a Where's Waldo and spent you know, way too much time trying to find him. <laughs> way too much time. So imagine those poor pathologists counting all those eosinophils. 
Great. Well, if anyone else had any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or go ahead and unmute yourself. If not, I think that may actually be a great place to wrap up unless you have any final thoughts, Sana. No, I just, again, wanted to thank you all. Um, one of the things I, um, one of the things I had, uh, I discovered when I, um, uh, when I was pregnant stock was that uh, Jefferson and um, George Washington actually did not, uh, were not friends at all for the last five to 10 years of their life. And I was like, you know, we need to make sure we do things like this, that their subsequent academic institutions remain talking. <laughs> I love that. We are happy to be part of that. And, and I, I know that Tim made an offer to connect you with people, but I'm sure there are other people who will be happy to collaborate. GW is extremely collaborative. Um, well, thank, thank you, you for again. The yeah, I, I really appreciate y'all's time and um, your thoughtful insights and your questions. Great. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we will see you again. I believe November 12th is the next event, but you can always, yes, it is November 12th. Um, we'll be talking about T-cells turning up the pressure with uh, Mina Madhur, who is an assistant professor of the Department of Medicine, Divisions of Clinical Pharmacology and Cardiology at Vanderbilt. So stay tuned for that one. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.